A warm welcome to you, Covenant Presbyterian Church family and friends. I pray that you and your family are staying safe and healthy, and you are encouraged in the Lord during these times. You should have received an email or a letter by now letting you know that the session has charged a reopening committee to do some research to put together a reopening plan for us. The session is set to meet May the 18th to receive this report and Lord willing make some decisions as it pertains to our reopening. Pray for our reopening committee as they have already been diligently working. If you did not receive that email, that means that we do not have your email address. So go to our website, scroll all the way to the bottom, and there you can click and add your name to our email list to receive updates from the church. I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know your highs or your lows this past week. I do know that he is worthy of our attention that he is worthy of our worship. We have to work extra hard these days to keep our focus and to worship our great God. So I want to encourage you during this time of prelude that you prepare your hearts for worship. call to worship is from Isaiah 55. Hear the word of the Lord. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. 
And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, or your labors for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me here that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Let's pray together. O Lord, as the Isaiah passage reminds us, we often spend ourselves and, and we put our hope in things that do us no good. Or we long for things that are only distractions from your grace. Like C.S. Lewis said, we are like those children who are playing in the mud because we don't know what it means to be invited to play at the ocean side. We settle for less. And worse, we willingly sin, offending you, our holy God. How could you forgive us? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You tell us to come. And we have come to ask your forgiveness, to rejoice in your gospel, and to know you more. Would you help us, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, it is in the name of the Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. pray with me from the book of Ephesians. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. This is holiness and purity that we did not earn, but it comes from Jesus's work alone. And since we believe in him, his righteousness is counted to us. But Lord, we confess that sin still dwells in us. We are sinners by nature and by choice. 
We fail to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we fail to love our neighbors as ourselves. But thank you, Father, for the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, you predestined us for adoption to yourself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to your will, to the praise of your glorious grace with which you have blessed us. We have redemption through Jesus' blood. We have forgiveness of our trespasses. All this is not because of us, but according to the riches of your grace, which you lavished upon us. And this is the mystery of your will. It's a plan from the fullness of time. You have united us with yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the work of Christ Jesus. O Lord, we pray for our civil authorities. We ask that they would ensure for the church full, free, and unquestioned liberty to work out every part of our ministry without violence or without danger. Lord, let no state anywhere interfere with or hinder your church. Would you cause your church to flourish throughout the world? And Lord, for your church throughout the world, we pray that you would build up the saints in holiness and comfort and that you would convince and convert sinners, that by your law you would convict us and by your gospel you would comfort us. Lord, for this, our church, for covenant, we pray that you would help us to put away falsehood and to speak truth with our neighbor because we are members one of another. Help us not to sin in our anger and, let, uh, and, and not to let the sun go down on our anger. Help us to give no opportunity to the devil. Equip us for honest work with our hands so that we may have something to share with the one who is in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Help us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. Lord, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put far away from us, along with all malice. Help us to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave us. Lord, as we think about the afflicted, help them to consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us in the second coming of our Lord Jesus. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 43. If you would turn in your Bibles to follow along. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 43. This is the word of the Lord. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it, because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know this may be hard for some of you to believe. When I was growing up and I would get in trouble, that's the part that is hard for you to believe, me getting in trouble. I was the baby of, I had an older brother and an older sister, and we always got in trouble. I always got in trouble because of them. And when we would get in trouble and our parents would come into the room or wherever we were and they would rebuke us or correct us, mom or dad would say, do you hear me? And we would say, yes, we hear you. And and then they would say, well, you better do more than hear me. You better heed me. We have been looking at uh, the sermon on a level place. Uh, Jesus has been instructing what his disciples or how his disciples are to live. His disciples are to live a life that is different than the rest of the world. The disciples of Jesus are to be different. They are to to live counter culture. Jesus ends this powerful sermon on how his disciple, or how to know the disciples of Jesus, and how to know those who are not disciples of Jesus. And he basically says, "You can determine this by their fruit." With that, let's pray. Lord, as we open your inerrant, infallible, authoritative word, we know that all scripture is God-breathed. We pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will understand your word. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, apply your word. May we be changed and transformed by the preaching of your word. For the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Some of us, for the last few weeks, have been studying the attributes of God. We have been looking at the lectures by Stephen Lawson with Ligonier Ministries. Uh, You are welcome to join us. We we meet on Mondays at noon at Zoom, and so please join us if you would like. We have talked about the attributes of God. We've looked at that God is sovereign. He's in control of all things at all times, in every tongue, tribe, and nation. God is holy. Uh, God is everywhere at all times and he's there perfectly and completely Uh, we've looked at that that god knows all things and he knows all things perfectly there is nothing that god does not know and there's nothing that god needs to learn we've talked about that god is all powerful Uh, one of the quotes that stephen lawson said was that god's god works god's way For God's glory. No one can thwart or undermine God's purposes. Uh, During this study, our study of of the attributes of God, I have become more and more aware of the awesomeness of God. Have you ever been overwhelmed by the awesomeness of God? Uh, Sometimes this happens when you are earnestly seeking uh, to understand how awesome our God is. And then in your studies, in your working through how awesome God is, you come to a place 
And it's a place that some of us don't like being. And and it's a place where it's a great mystery about our God. Uh, Deuteronomy speaks to this. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Church, I know this is hard for some of us to hear and for some of us to understand and for some of us to apply. Because if you're like me, we absolutely hate mystery. Uh, we like mystery novels. We, we may like mystery movies, but all of those we can figure out. And at some point, you're able to point back to some of the evidence and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense now. But the reality is there are some things that God has not allowed for us to figure out about himself. There are secret things that belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed, the things that are exposed or uncovered belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. There are absolutely truths that God has made known through his word, through his people. Uh, These things we need to study. These are the things that we need to, to work at of how to apply. Jesus makes it clear that there is no mystery to those who are his disciples, and to those who are not his disciples. The real proof of a disciple of Jesus is not whether you hear what Jesus has to say, but whether are you actually doing the things that he commands you to do. Do you not only hear Jesus, but do you heed Jesus? Do you apply Jesus? What Jesus? Do you do the commands that Jesus commands his people to do? How do you prove your faith? You prove it by heeding the commands of Jesus. Look at verse 43. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. A tree is known by its own fruit. A disciple of Jesus will have fruit that only a disciple of Jesus will have. A a non-disciple of Jesus will have fruit that is a non-disciple of Jesus. You produce the kind of fruit of what you are. Uh, James, in James uh, 1, verse 22, James gives an imperative, a, a command. He says to be doers, not just hearers of the word. Uh, It's the present tense of the verb here. It's to show that this is an ongoing action. Uh, This is to become a a habit. The disciples of Jesus are to live out the command of Jesus because of Jesus. The, uh, The disciples of Jesus are to live out the commands of Jesus in a world that is opposed to Jesus. In a world that is opposed to Christianity. The disciples of Jesus are to live out the command of Jesus in a world that contradicts the word of Almighty God. In this sermon, Jesus commands his disciples to take an intense interest in someone else. And in some cases, not just someone else, but to take an intense interest in their enemy. Now, I don't know about you, but at the core of my being, I can sometimes be self-absorbed. I can sometimes be self-centered. I can easily be selfish. And if my wife was here, if you were able to see my wife, uh, she would be nodding her head in an agreement. And I'm only talking about the people who I love A lot I can be these things, much less my own enemies. Jesus has set the bar high for his disciples. And the only way one can live out the command of Jesus is based off the fact of who Jesus is, what Jesus has accomplished on behalf of his people. Jesus is saying, you will recognize my disciples by their fruit. In verse 45, 
A good person out of the good treasures of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Every tree produces its own kind of fruit. Out of the abundance of the heart. Here the the heart is the, the center of a person's being. Who they really are. The, the ideal here is, is the heart is who you, uh, who you are when no one else is around. The reason why we say the things we say. The reason why we do the things we do. Because we are the people who we are. Now I want to be slow here for a minute, Christian. One of the, the easy things for us to do is to take this. Uh, to take Jesus' word and say, Jesus is saying that we are to examine the fruit of other people to determine on whether or not they are a disciple of Jesus or not. And, and certainly in some ways we can do that. But, but Jesus, I would argue the heart of this is, is Jesus is saying to his disciples to do a self-examination, to examine their own fruit. So let me ask you this. If you claim Christ and Christ claims you, Does your life, does your fruit reflect what a disciple of Jesus looks like? When was the last time these words left your lips? I am sorry. Will you forgive me? When was the last time you had a heart felt encouraging word for someone without a but at the end of your encouraging words to them when was the last time you saw your sin in all of its ugliness and you repented before you got caught when was the last time you extended grace and mercy to someone Who was not worthy of your pity. Prove your faith. Not with words only. But with actions. Uh, Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. About the freedom that they have in Christ. And what a disciple of Jesus looks like. And and the fruit of the disciples of Jesus. In in Galatians 5, 29, we could spend an entire sermon series, and maybe we will one day, on the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, uh, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. At some point today, Christian, before the day is out, look at this list. Examine your heart. Examine your life uh, uh, with these in mind, and do you beat up to these fruit, to these uh, these kind of fruit? Are they exhibited in your life? Bearing good fruit means loving more, loving others more than yourself. Bearing good fruit means to have a joy, and even in the midst of sorrow. In, the, in, the, in walks of all life, having a joy, having a, a doxology about your life, having a praise God from whom all blessings flow on the tip of your tongue in all situations, uh, having a joy even in the midst of COVID-19. Bearing good fruit means to have peace which surpasses all understanding in all situations. Do you know someone who has a peace about themselves regardless of their situation? I do. Many of you have a peaceful disposition about yourself. Christian, do you understand that you are blessed regardless of your situation? And I am by no means making light of your situation My granny was a great example of what it meant to live a life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, She has since gone to be with the Lord. But I can honestly say that there was, I cannot recall a time when my granny complained about anything. 
My granny lived a long, fruitful life. Uh, the Lord called her home at the age of 98. And the reality is, because she lived so long on this side of heaven, she experienced a lot of real pain, a lot of real hurt, a lot of real disappointments. Uh, she battled uh, cancer. Uh, she, uh, battled, uh, she had a stroke. Uh, at the age of 94, she had emergency surgery to remove her gallbladder because it had, uh, it had erupted and it began to infect her entire body. She outlived that. Uh, she lamented the death of all of her brothers and sisters. Uh, she outlived her husband. Uh, she uh, outlived two of her children. Uh, it's not the, the circle of life should be that a, a parent should not have to bury their children. And, and I know some of you have experienced the loss of children. In the midst of all of her pain, my granny never doubted that she was loved by Jesus. She never once expressed anything less than joy. Not joy in her situation, but joy in knowing Jesus. Uh, greater than that, the, the joy of being known by Jesus. Bearing good fruit means having patience, kindness, uh, goodness. Uh, again, and I will slow down on my illustrations there, and, and you can uh, go to the Lord and ask Him to examine your life, examine yourself as it relates to patience, goodness, self control. One commentator said a, a fruitful life is characterized by consistent godliness. So that, I am, uh, so that I am as good in private as I seem to be in public. If your private life was exposed, what would we see? If you claim Christ and Christ claims you, hear these words. I know we are not perfect. We all struggle we all struggle with the, the constantly uh, bearing good fruit. But that's just it. It is a struggle. And it is a struggle because of Jesus. And Christian, it is a struggle that we know one day will end. When Jesus returns to redeem, to reclaim, and to make all things new. Brothers and sisters, keep on keeping on in your struggle to live a godly life on this side of heaven. Paul uh, wrote about living a godly life and the struggle to live a godly life on this side of heaven. If you haven't done so, go read uh, in Romans 7. And, and Paul uh, writes about the great struggle in, that he had to live a godly life. And then right on the hills of the end of that chapter begins the beautiful chapter of Romans 8. And Romans 8 opens with, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christian, while we are on this side of heaven, it is a struggle. But know that because of Jesus, because of his life, his death, his resurrection, you are not condemned, but redeemed. When I was in high school, our high school took pride in our athletics. And so we had these catchy phrases that we would put on T-shirts and we thought we were cool. And, and our mascot was the Bulldog. And so there was a shirt, and I still have it at home. Uh, it says, if you can't hang with the big dogs, then stay on the porch. Uh, one of our coaches, one of my favorite coaches of all times, uh, would say, and I quote him often, I do this uh, when I, uh, even when I uh, do wedding rehearsals or any type of rehearsals, you play the way you practice. So Coach Crockett put a lot of weight in practice. He would also say, can you walk the talk? You like to talk like you are a champion, but can you walk that out? Can you prove that you are a champion? In, verses, in verse 43, Jesus was asking those, who are there to hear him preach, are you walking what you are talking? He says, some of you call me Lord, yet you do not do what I tell you to do. J.C. Ryle says, 
Obedience is the only sound evidence of saving faith. And the talk of the lips is worse than useless if it is not accompanied by sanctification of life. Sanctification is our growth in Christ. It is useless if there is talk with no walk. Jesus then tells another parable. Look at verse 47. Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Did you catch the three action verbs in verse 47? Go back and look at verse 47. Come, hear, do. There were folks during this time who, who came together. They, they literally came near to Jesus to hear, to hear his teachings. They heard the command of Jesus. But coming and hearing was not enough. Jesus commanded his disciples to do. The ESV does a a great job here, I think, in showing that this is in the present active tense. It is a continual, productive, progressive action of the disciples of Jesus. He said, this person built their house of faith in the solid foundation of the rock. When the storm of life hits up against it, the house will not be moved. The house is built on a solid foundation. Church, can we be honest for a moment? Building your house on a solid foundation cost you something. Building your house on solid ground takes work. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears must go into you building your house on unshakable ground. You have to give up self. You have to love and pray for your enemies. You have to be willing to count everything as rubbish for the sake of following Jesus Christ. You have to be generous, gracious, forgiving. You have to discipline yourself to avail yourself to the means of grace. Your theology has to be built on the foundational truths of God's word. Not your current situation. Not your feelings. You have to know God's unshakable truths. So that when life hits you. When the waves of life try to overcome you. In the words of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 43. You shall not fear. And the opposite is true. If you hear without doing, or if you uh, hear and you think, well, that's what other people should be doing, then you build your house on shaky ground. A little rain, a little wind, a few things don't go your way, uh, your feelings get hurt, your feelings get challenged. And the foundation is blown down. So what is the conclusion of the matter before us today? Again, J.C. Ryle says, Such a man's religion may cost him much. Like the house built on a rock, it may entail on him pains, labor, and self-denial. To lay aside pride and self-righteousness. To crucify the rebellious flesh. To put on the mind of Christ. To take up the cross daily. To count all things but loss for Christ's sake. All this may be hard work. But like the house built on rock, such religion will stand. The streams of affliction may beat violently upon it. And the floods of persecution dash fiercely against it. But it will not give away. What kind of foundation are you building? 
if your answer is a, a solid, firm foundation, does your life reflect that foundation? Maybe a, a, another way to ask that question is, does your life reflect the life of Jesus? If you know your life does not reflect the life of Jesus, I want to encourage you, and I want to warn you to repent and to believe, not in yourself, but believe in the complete and finished work of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, our prayer as your people is that you would abide in with us, that no matter what is going on in our lives right now, that our mind, our heart, our eyes would be focused upon you and you alone. And Lord Jesus, we do pray that if there is someone in our midst who doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. May they repent and believe, for it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Christian, look up. Open your eyes. Receive the, these words of, of blessing from you, from the Lord. May the one who grants you mercy and pardon of sin and makes you righteous before his throne for his name's sake also grant you peace on this day and forevermore. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.